Every second, our planet receives millions of subatomic particles from space. Some of them interact frequently with matter, and because of this they are relatively easy to detect and study. However, not all subatomic particles have the same behavior. Particles such as neutrinos pass through matter practically without interacting with anything, and not exactly because they are few in number, since they are actually the most abundant particles in our universe. If we consider only the neutrinos generated by the chemical reactions that occur in our sun, it is estimated that 60 trillion neutrinos pass through each square centimeter of our body every second. Technically, a neutrino could interact with our body, but even with the enormous amount of them passing through us every moment, the probabilities are really low and we may spend our whole life without this happening. To put the low interaction of these particles in context, it is estimated that for every 100 billion neutrinos that pass through the center of our planet, that is passing through more than 12,000 kilometers of Earth and other materials, only one would interact on the way with any other particle. There are two main reasons why neutrinos practically don't interact with anything. The first is that they possess extremely low mass. Although the exact value of their mass is not yet known, their upper limit has been defined and recent studies estimate that a neutrino has at most a mass of only 0.8 electron volts, having a mass about 600,000 times smaller than electrons, or 1,173 million times smaller than the mass of hydrogen, the lightest atom in the periodic table. With such a small value, it is difficult to even imagine the mass of neutrinos, but what is important here is that they are in fact the lowest mass particles known in the universe today. On the other hand, the second reason for their low interaction is that neutrinos do not possess an electric charge, hence the name neutrino, and because of this, they are also not affected by electromagnetic fields nor do they generate them with their motion, as an electron or proton would. Moreover, as if this did not complicate the detection and study of these particles enough, there is another problem. At every moment, we are being affected by dozens of other particles that are detected as signals similar to and even stronger than those produced by neutrinos, which makes it difficult to distinguish the weak and infrequent manifestations of the particles in matter. However, even though the odds are not in our favor, that does not mean that it is an impossible task. So in this video we will see how a neutrino detector works and how they manage to overcome all those difficulties. The first problem we must solve is the amount of noise in the measurements generated by other particles, in order to make sure that every signal we receive is indeed neutrinos and not something else. To do this, one of the most commonly used methods is to place the neutrino detector underground, as will be done by the Andes project that we discussed in the previous video. The idea behind this is that all the rock between the surface and the neutrino detector will act as a sieve or filter that will stop most of the particles, leaving at the end only the neutrinos that did not interact along the way. Once this is taken care of, we can focus on how the detector is constructed. Throughout the world there are several neutrino detectors with different variations in their design that allow you to study these particles. Among these, one of the most famous in the world due to its large size is the Super Cameo Candy, located near the city of Hida in Japan and installed 1,000 meters underground. This particular neutrino detector works thanks to the Cherenkov effect, which is characterized by the emission of electromagnetic radiation when a charged particle travels faster than the speed of light in a given medium. This phenomenon is similar to what happens when an object exceeds the speed of sound and generates a cone-shaped pressure wave. Although exceeding the speed of light is not possible in a vacuum, in materials with a higher refractive index, light travels at a lower speed, and some particles such as electrons manage to overcome this limit, generating a certain characteristic brightness that is named after this effect. In fact, in nuclear reactor pools, it is completely normal for this to occur and is used as an indicator of the state of the reactions that are taking place. So far so good. But how does this apply to neutrinos if they have no charge? The truth is that they are not exactly what generates this effect. On the rare occasions when a neutrino interacts with something, it is able to pull an electron from the particle with which it collided, being that electron the one that generates the Cherenkov effect. Understanding this, the way a neutrino detector is constructed is conceptually quite simple. The main element needed is ultra-pure water, which provides a homogeneous medium with which the neutrinos can interact, 
as well as having an ideal refractive index and chemical composition to generate the effect that we mentioned. This water must be extremely pure, mainly for two reasons. First, to avoid false positives, because if the water contained radioactive elements, even in very small quantities, the Cherenkov effect could be generated when they decay into other particles. And second, since the system depends on the detection of light emitted by this ultrafast electron, which is very faint when we are talking about collisions with neutrinos, water cannot have other particles that diminish its visibility. In addition, it is usually used in large quantities, creating a larger volume with which these particles can collide, being the size of a 10-story building approximately and being able to contain more than 50,000 tons of water. Finally, hundreds of photomultipliers or light sensors are added to this pure water tank to measure the radiation emitted by the Cherenkov effect and thus detect the neutrinos that collide inside. As I mentioned at the beginning, the Super Cameo Candy is only one of many neutrino detectors that exist in the world, and although we use this one as a reference, not all of them work in the same way. There are different types of detectors to study specific characteristics of neutrinos. While some may specialize in counting the number of neutrinos, others may focus on calculating the amount of energy they possess, the direction from which they came, or their state of oscillation, among other things. We should also consider that neutrino astronomy is very new as a science, so every year new technologies are developed to improve the accuracy of some of these experiments. An example of this is the Borexino experiment located at the Grand Sasso National Laboratory in Italy, which uses a scintillator fluid instead of water. This fluid is a material that, upon receiving certain types of particles, transforms their energy into ultraviolet light that can be measured by certain instruments. But the changes are not limited to using a different material. There are other neutrino detectors that, instead of having a tank of material and being surrounded by photomultipliers, are composed of a series of arrays of these devices that are installed directly at a site of interest. Examples of this are the Ice Cube project, whose detectors are located about 1.5 kilometers under the ice of the South Pole, or the Antares project, which is being installed on the seabed at a depth of 2.5 kilometers on the coast of France. Both use the same Cherenkov effect as the Super Cameo Candy, but in totally different conditions. I hope you liked this video. That's all for now and see you in the next one.